Hello and welcome to day four on the 2020 online Athens Women's Football Summit. Today I've got the one and only James Galanis. And look, all I was going to say for any young coaches, anybody who wants to get involved in coaching, get those pen and paper out there, get it on your desk because today is all about looking at the basics of being an effective coach. And uh, no pressure, James, but I know you've got some golden nuggets to share. And, you know, I'm all about education and I want people to really take action after the knowledge you share. Like there's a quote I follow by is results come from action, not from discussion. Tony Robbins. And today is all about the basics. We just had a great session with, you know, two great coaches at the top of their game. And I thought today, let's go back to the basics. And before we start, James, I would love you just to share your coaching career journey, when did it all start? Yeah, so started in um, 1997. Um, I arrived in the US and, and basically got involved in, in, in a soccer camp um, in Pennsylvania. Um, went over there, discovered a, an, an abundance of talent um, in terms of, of, of the kids that I was working with. Um, and kind of fell in love with um, with helping out um, these these talented kids. And um, I was working for a company at the time. And as the years went by, I I wanted to do something on my own and develop my own philosophy and and implement um, my own ideas. Um, I I knew I had a um, you know a, a unique upbringing in terms of what uh, I had learned through my time as a as a player and as a person growing up in Australia. Um, and and eventually I got the courage and, and I started coaching and I started uh, with Universal Soccer Academy, which is a, um, a soccer school that focuses on individual development. Um, I moved on and I got another job as a technical director for Medford Strikers Soccer Club, which is a prestigious club here in, in New Jersey. And and now I'm also the uh, technical director for uh, New Jersey Youth Soccer. Um, so it started a long time ago and, and through a strong philosophy, I was able to have success and, and now I carry three hats. Awesome. Well, before we go in detail, uh, James and I were both at Athens last year in person. We said off air, like, we wish we were together drinking a Greek coffee and doing this conversation with you. Uh, the difference is I've outgrown you on the beard, my friend. But uh, uh, all I, all I want to talk about now is, you know, going back to the basics of, you know, having a coaching philosophy. So would you mind just going back with your coaching journey right from the start and how in time you've managed to build a philosophy working at the grassroots level and also top international players as well in the game? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, so first of all, what does the, the word philosophy mean? It actually means in Greek, uh, a love of wisdom. So, uh, you know, when you philosophize, it's basically you're trying to acquire knowledge um, that you put into your life or, or your practice or your coaching or, or whatever it is that you're doing. Um, with me, when I first started coaching, um, the only thing that I could do at that time, right at the beginning, was um, pretty much reflect on my time as a soccer player growing up. And, and that's what I was searching into. I was searching into um, you know, what my coaches were doing when I was growing up. Um, and and trying to figure out what methods were they using, um, and I and I discovered that um, you know a lot of the training was based around technical skills and and tactical awareness and 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 physical power, and then you know as part of this reflection process, while I was trying to figure out what type of coach I want to be, I started to really think about you know why a lot of top players that I grew up with um, didn't make it to to the highest level and and why a lot of them came up short and you know with that reflection process I discovered that um, the psychological piece was the piece that kind of um, kept them back um, you know I had so many great friends that um, you know were fantastic in in all areas of the game but you know, either lack discipline or, 
or, or didn't have the right character skills or, or, or lacked respect or um, couldn't make sacrifices, um, things that always came back to the mind. So um, when I started to build my philosophy, I wanted to make sure that the, that the mental piece um, is clearly a part of that to make sure that the kids that I'm going to be working with uh, are equipped with those tools and I don't become one of these coaches that only worries about you know the skills and the tactics and the phys- physical part but also um, like I said the mental piece and with that I discovered I, I developed um, my own philosophy which is the five pillars of a champion philosophy that's what I, I use now um, where every every kid that comes through um, my academy I look at them through the five pillars uh, technical skills, which is you know your your comfort with, with with the ball at your feet, tactical awareness, what you're doing without the ball, physical power, which is a body that can outwork the opponent, mental toughness, which is your game day mentality, and in character, which is really um, doing the right things when no one is watching, and are you coachable? Um, so I look at I look at all the kids that I work with and all the students that I work with. Um, even adults and professionals, I look at them through the five pillars. Um, and that's been my philosophy um, uh, that I've been using for 23 years and it works. Um, and something that's important, Ed, is, is it, it, it's simple to understand and it makes sense to me and it makes sense to my kids and my students. Um, and that's why it's successful. So when you talk about philosophies, um, you know, it, it can't be too complicated. And you've got to be able to explain it in a short period of time. Hey, simplicity is key. But really quickly, there's one area, one pillar I really like to dig deep in because because it comes back to sort of background and upbringing. Like, how do you coach the, f- the fifth pillar with character, if that makes sense? Like I, like the technical, the, the tactical and, you know, game day, having having that right mindset. But when it comes down to character, it comes, you know, it goes back to your roots for that individual. May I ask how you provide sort of tactics or methods where you focus on that one area of improvement for that player? Yeah, so as part of your 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 coaching curriculum and, and your philosophy, um, you got to find time to study uh, the, the key qualities of, of a person of character. So I spend time with my kids, um, you know, whether it's it's through Zooms as we, we're doing now or, or at the field, um, the last 15 minutes of practice, and, and we talk about things. We talk about, you know, respect. We talk about being a good teammate. We talk about um, dealing with adversity. We talk about sportsmanship. We talk about having respect. We talk about the things that build character. So... Um, we kind of instill it from a really young age, um, and it's a topic just as, as as juggling and dribbling and turning and attacking and defending is important to the game. So are the character pieces. So we spend time studying those things, but but also um, sometimes that's not enough. Um, and and the, as a coach, I look for moments where I can teach character. Um, so, for example, you know, if, if from a young age, if a kid passes the ball to, to a teammate and the, the pass isn't on and then the one, the teammate that was receiving the ball, you know, waves their hands up or rolls their eyes or, or has some sort of uh, negative action, um, I'll address it. I'll pull them over to the side, say, hey, listen, you know, not no one's perfect. Everyone's going to make mistakes. You make mistakes too. You know, it's best that you you move on and, and understand that we're all going to make mistakes through throughout our career and, and you can't allow that to happen because it's going to cause a problem between you and your teammates and, and we move on. Uh, you know, another example is, you know, um, we lose a game and, and – You've got players that don't want to shake hands with the the opponents. Uh, You know, pull them up on the side afterwards, and you you, you explain to them the importance of sportsmanship. So it's so it's it's teaching them, and then looking for the moments that arise throughout their youth journeys 
there you can fix the, the the character piece. And and I've seen a lot of a lot of coaches that have ignored these character pieces at a young age, and they they went from little problems to really big problems that that are very difficult to fix um, at a later stage. Just on that point, um, like from a grassroots perspective, because I've interviewed other coaches on my podcast show, and they say at the bottom, at the grassroots, that's where the real coaching happens. It's when you deal with the the top players, it gets a bit more tricky. So my ask, not with a real life example, but with a top player who needs to improve on the areas of the mindset and the you know the the character element, how do you address it at the top level with a top player, for example? Yeah, I mean, it, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard as they move along. And 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 I'll tell you a story. Um, I I had a player that um, came to me. He was uh, under sixteen U.S. national team player, under eighteen national team player, under twenty national team player. He ended up playing professionally, um, both in 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 the U.S. and abroad. Um, and he was a fantastic player. And when I first evaluated him, I couldn't find any flaws in his game. Um, when I went and watched him play, um, you know, he he lacked discipline. He was he was arguing with the referee. He was arguing with his teammates. He was arguing with the coaches, his own coaches, um, and he was basically getting derailed um, every time he played. So my attention quickly shifted from. Um, the skill element to 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 the mental element. Um, with with a bit of digging, I found out that when he was young, uh, as a ten year old, that's when it all started. And he had a coach that was driven with with winning and allowed him to 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 use this type of behaviour um, and didn't do anything about it. And it kind of got ingrained in him. Um, and you know it was hard to break um, at the end, and, and it really impacted his his career at the at the senior level. Um, now, you know, if I was the coach uh, of a player like that at ten years old, um, and he he showed that type of behaviour, uh, he would definitely um, see a bit of bench time, um, and I wouldn't reward him until his behaviour changed and and he showed first class character. Um, so you got to catch it young, um, and you got to remember as a coach that you know most of your players aren't going to become pros, and you've got to really turn them into outstanding human beings with character, and that should be your number one your number one goal. And you do that from a, as early as you can. You can you can start doing that in a, in a soft way, even as a seven eight year old. So you got to catch it early. What I say, everybody, I told you this guy's going to give you some value bombs today. I'm just going to go reverse it now. So let's say you have somebody with great character, great mental strength, you know, of like how they prepare for a game. But let's go back to, let's say, the tactical awareness. Because I think this is important because they could be great on the ball but may not see their surroundings. Would you mind just providing some tips at the grassroots level where coaches can apply that with, you know, young kids who've just got that potential but just need that improvement in that pillar, if that makes sense? The tactical pillar. Yeah. Yeah, so that's another interesting question, Ed. Um, so there's there's the hands-on approach where, you know, you're stopping practice and you're, you're moving the pieces um, as a coach, or there's the um, being patient and giving your players the time to find the tactical solutions um, on their own, um, and I'm a fan of of the second one. Um, when I do my training, I like to you know give the, the my players a, a, an idea of of what we're doing. Let's just say we're we're, we're playing a game where the, the the purpose is to to put to play the ball wide to stretch the opponent out. You know, you can go in there and and you can give them uh, the solutions right from the beginning, or you can just let them figure it out and. And I like to let them figure it out. Um, and I find that now that the, the players uh, look into their own mind to find tactical solutions in games rather than waiting for you um, as a coach. But in terms of improving, I don't think there's a, there's been a better time uh, improving your tactical awareness 
as as it is now with everything that's going on with cameras and and games being taped and that um, the best way to to learn um, tactically is to visually watch yourself. So having access to, to videos um, really helps a lot. But um, at the end of the day, you want thinkers that create solutions on their own rather than um, players that, that are looking to you to create the solution for them. Great point. And I, I want to bring on this topic now of like a player taking ownership as well. Like how important is that? Where in my podcast, you said the best players do most of the training when we don't see. So for any young players do watching in, like how is this sort of 10,000 hour rule is so important to, you know, hopefully reach the best or hopefully, you know, be the player they want to be. Uh, but, but, but taking ownership of their own practice without the coach seeing, if that makes sense. Yeah, so um, when you go to training, you're you're under the spotlight. That's the first thing that you've got to think about. Um, you're there. You you've got to perform. You you've got to reach a certain level uh, in terms of to be able to execute uh, plays with your team in order to impress your coach and show them that you you're worthy of of starting on the weekend. So um, with that, you're not really in any type of experiment mode or repetition mode or, or real practice mode that is going to allow you to improve as an individual. So if you're relying just on your Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday practice with your team, um, you're not really giving yourself a great chance um, to really develop as an individual. In order to develop as an individual, um, you've got to be put in an environment where there is no coach um, where you're able to just try things and do things until you you get it right. Playing with freedom, um, that's where the best best football players on the planet, at the end of the day, um, street soccer was their teacher, um, where they could just go out there and not worry about anything and, and just try something until um, they got it right. So, you know, Kids today are playing less and less on the street, um, and and that's a shame. But um, they can still clock in hours. You've got to kind of modernise what's going on today. I like my teams. I I I have them all on a group text, and they text each other, and they just say, "Hey, I'm going to this park. Uh, if anybody wants to come." And and their whole sometimes they get the whole team out there playing with freedom, and sometimes they're playing on their own. So we've got to adapt. But at the end of the day, um, it's definitely about what you're doing when no one is watching, playing by yourself, expressing yourself, taking risks, making mistakes, and not worrying about um, that evaluating eye of of a coach. Just with regards to making mistakes, uh, as a coach perspective, how important are making mistakes to grow as a coach? You mean me as a, a a coach themselves? Yeah, I just want people to realise when you're a coach, you're not perfect, uh, that you do make mistakes as well, not just the players. So I was just wondering, like any young coaches watching, it, they got to still take risks like the players, but just in a different hat, meaning the coach. Yeah, so so for me, a mistake is when you when you make the wrong decision over and over again and you're not learning from it. So. Um, yeah, you know, if you make a mistake and you learn from it, then obviously it's a lesson, and and that's a good thing. So you're always going to make decisions that that you that could have been better. So as long as you're really self evaluating, the same way as a player, you should self evaluate. You self evaluate as a coach as well. Um, and when you make mistakes, and and that's whether you know, let's say for example that the opponent was playing long ball and and you really didn't tell your 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 team to drop back um, early in the game and we can see the two early goals and we never recovered from it. Um, you know, that, that's an example where you say, okay, next time I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell them right from the first minute if I identify it. Um, but really making mistakes and, and, and learning from them and turning them into lessons um, you're always going to make mistakes, whether you're a player, you're a coach, um, and that's okay. The, the The problem is that thinking that you're perfect and that you don't make mistakes as a coach, 
that's when you, you, you get in trouble. But being able to put your hand up um, and even internally say, oh, well, I made a mistake there and next time I'm going to do take this road instead of this road, then it's it's fine. And the one thing I want to add now, uh, in our podcast, our, our session was all about being a creative coach. And you shared a wonderful story over some great Greek food about how martial arts, how you got some inspiration there, which you sort of trans you know, trans transcended onto the football pitch with regards to visu visualization and meditation. I just want coaches to realize that you don't have to follow, you know, the manual all the time. You can learn from other sports. May I ask from that story, which I put very briefly, I'd love you to go in depth, how that has supported you as a coach reflecting now? Yeah, so, um, yeah, I did martial arts for years um, and we, we used to meditate. We used to meditate um, before every session um, and sometimes even halfway through the sessions. Um, and when I was younger, I, I really didn't believe in it. I started martial arts when I was about eight and I remember um everybody got their eyes closed and they're they're in deep thought and i'm kind of looking around like what's everyone doing they're crazy but but as i got older i started to 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 really believe in it um and then there was one time when halfway through a session um my my sensei asked us to 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 lay down actually and we laid down and we're looking up at the ceiling close your eyes and we started to visualize um different different parts of fighting and he would he was saying you know imagine someone's coming with their right hand and they're about to punch you in the face and you you, you shift over to the side and you 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 counter with a left to their chin uh, imagine somebody's uh, takes two steps forward and they're about to kick you in the side of the head and you move out of the way to your right and you you come in with a with a strike to the stomach and he was putting us through all these these possible scenarios and then five minutes later, we're up at fighting, and and those those scenarios that he played for us through the uh, through the whole meditation process and visualization process, they actually popped up through the fight. And I executed this those skills at lightning pace and without even thinking about it. It was like Arthur was like, "Wow, did I really do that?" And that kind of sparked the belief in me in visualization so from that point on i took the visualization from karate and i started to apply it into my soccer life so i started to i used to play midfield i started to think about playing in the midfield and winning balls winning headers passes taking shots from from a distance saying things to myself that i'm going to work box to box or or where I'm going to run to be available. And I used to kind of play over the upcoming game in my head. And I, I know that that made me such a better soccer player because of the, the preparation that I was giving to my mind, which now I've discovered is the most important thing. So I took that meditation and visualization piece from karate. I transferred over as a soccer player. And now... I, it's a big part of my methodology um, as a coach. And I do the same thing. I actually did it last week. I had a group of boys that um, I was teaching them the mechanics of, of, of shooting. Um, and I, I let them go in the beginning and then I, I let them shoot like uh, for a good 10 minutes. And then I, I stopped them and I said, all right, everyone close your eyes. And I want you to think about this planted foot next to the ball, um, leaning over the ball striking foot toes pointed all the way back striking right through the middle of the ball and following through and landing forward i want you to think about that and i gave them a good minute to think about it and they went back and all of a sudden they're striking the ball a lot better and they started looking at each other like wow this stuff works you know so um so it, it definitely works and yeah i i agree that's something that i transferred from another sport into into my methodology and another thing i want to add to like because you said on my podcast you've got to create your own blueprint and i love how you said that like we've talked about the five pillars which is your philosophy but if coaches are listening you know you're still going to add your own blueprint of your own identity um you, you showed me all the different apps how you keep learning how you keep reading books how important is self-development for you to always to stay you know in the game with your own philosophy 
when you coach these, you know, players? Oh, so important. Um, you know, if you take if you take a year off without learning and you fall behind, I mean, you just see what what happens in in terms of a, a playing philosophy and and how teams play. Look what happens. Um, you know, if you go back, you know, four or five years ago, everyone wanted to be Barcelona. Everyone was playing like Barcelona. Then you know, Liverpool came along. They started doing well with the high pressing and so on. And now all of a sudden, everyone's doing high pressing. And we're, we're seeing this even at the youth level. Uh, all of a sudden, teams are in your half and, and they're doing the high pressing because of, of Liverpool. Now, uh, it's shifting again. Everyone's starting to think like Bayern. Uh, more athletic, the defensive line is even further past the halfway line. So they they coming in even deeper and really trying to choke you from getting the ball out. So my point is, if you stopped, you know, for for two or three years, your learning process and you think, yeah, I know what I'm doing. I don't need to do anything. You're going to fall behind in in that department. I'm just talking about the, the, the tactical piece. Um, but, you know, there's always layers of improvement that you can make in 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 your technical drills, obviously your tactical activities, uh, physically, science keeps popping up with 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 new apparatuses, new new equipment, new standards, and so on. And then you know, with the mental and the character piece, because of the the internet and the access that we have to all this information, um, you know, you can just keep learning um, from what's out there, especially from biographies from coaches um, and and not only coaches, soccer coaches or football coaches, but also other coaches. I, I read biographies of, of coaches in every single sport. Uh, you know, I love Popovich from the San Antonio Spurs. I mean, if anybody's um, read his book, I mean, he's, he's, he's amazing. And his principles, you can apply it to any sport or even any business. Um, so yeah, you've got to be addicted to learning. See, for me, I don't, it's not like I wake up and say, I want to, what am I going to learn today? Um, because it's got to be part of my program. I just love it. I wake up, first thing I do, I got my websites that I go on and I, and I, and I, and I hop on and I see what's going on in the world game. I have a book that I'm always reading. I read a chapter a day. Okay. I highlight what I like in the chapter. The next day I go back, I go backwards to my previous chapter. I see what I highlighted from yesterday and then I go on to the, the, the next chapter. All the access on YouTube, Netflix, all the documentaries that we've got now. I mean, there's so much information that, you know, if you're not consistently learning and improving, you are going to fall so far behind because we have so much information available to us today. Hey, that bit about the reading chapter, that's from uh, Dale Carnegie. That's what he says in How to Win Friends and Influence People. You reread what you read the day before and put it into practice. And look, talk about the uh, coaching side of, you know, you said a great point earlier that, you know, developing players, but also developing coaches is all about developing great people. And we had a, a Lisa Hugh uh, day one and I uh, had her on my podcast and she said, she started as in coaching and she's applying some of those principles, you know, in coaching in the business world of being the GM at Sky Blue. So the point I'm going to say is how is coaching a skill which is transferable into other industries such as business? Look, uh, coaching is coaching is leading. Um, that's what it is. You know, you've got a common goal and and you've got to get a group of people together. Um and you got to get them buying into the idea of of the goal that you're trying to, to reach. How we're going to get there, and and how are we going to work together, and how are we going to treat each other on the way to this goal? So it's the same as 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 any industry. If you've got you know a pizza shop and you've got workers in there, at the end of the day, you want to make a nice pizza, and You've got to get your team of of staff in your restaurant working together. It's the same if we're 
working for Mercedes and we want to pull out an amazing vehicle every year, it's the same thing. We've all got to work together um, to achieve that. So what you can learn through the game, okay, um, in terms of life skills is the most important part of playing this beautiful sport. And that's what people don't realize. People look at it through wins and losses. And I encourage parents, forget about the wins and losses. Look for moments that are going to help your child become a successful human being. I mean, you're competing every single week. You're working with other people to, to get a result. You're dealing with winning where you're on top of the world. You're dealing with losing where you're at the bottom of the world. You've got to respect your coaches, which means you've got to respect your boss one day. Okay? So these things that, these are some of the things, but the things that happen through the game transfer into life. And that's the most important thing. If you're late to practice, you're going to be late to work. If you don't respect your teammates, you won't respect your workmates. If you don't respect your coach, you won't respect your boss. If you're lazy on the field, you'll be lazy at work. But the difference is, this is just a game. But when you take that those approaches to normal life in a workplace, the consequences are harsher. You won't have a job. So for me, school teaches you certain values and and you have an opportunity to learn certain things. But sport, especially team sports, teaches you all these life skills that you can carry over that can make you successful. And let me just tell you this. It's a fact that big companies and big CEOs are looking for athletes because they know that they've been battle-tested in the departments that I touched on a second ago. Okay, they'd rather have an athlete that that has gone through the ringer, has dealt with adversity on a weekly basis than somebody that hasn't. So that when you coach, coach the person, that's the most important thing. And for me, the game is really the, the second piece. That's just the vehicle to, to get there to being a great person. I'm going to keep saying this. What did I say, everybody? I hope you're getting those, you know, <laughs> pens and paper out there because that was so powerful. But again, with the girls of podcast, you said you said a question to yourself where you always reevaluate. You you said a great question. How do I uh, want to be remembered as a coach? Like, and that's a question you say to yourself quite a lot. Out of interest, from a year from now, when I didn't have a beard and we were drinking iced coffee um, together, like, how have you developed as a coach? Reflecting now. Sorry to put you on the spot, but I'm intrigued. Um, yeah, I mean, I I keep changing. I, I, I keep changing. I keep learning. Um, you know, I, I, I learn from, like I said before, the material that I read and, and from the role models that, you know, as coaches that I look up to, um, you know, I change because of my decisions. Like I said, I'm, you know, you, you make some bad decisions and, and you take them and that redirects your – uh, the way you are moving forward, but the older I'm, I'm, I'm getting, the more um, I'm buying into, um, like in a big way, is is moving more from thinking like a coach to a teacher. I've always thought like that, but the older I'm getting, the the the, the more powerful um, that becomes in my mind. So when I'm out there. Um, that's how I think about it. You know, like if I see a kid that that's not working hard, you know, maybe, you know, 10 years ago, I, I would get angry and, and, and I would maybe, you know, raise my voice at the, at the kid. Um, but now I'm, I'm more pull them up on the side, have a conversation, uh, try the, the kind of route kind of a thing. Uh, cause I think about, you know, what would a, what would a teacher do in a classroom? They're just going to start yelling and screaming. Um, you know, there might be some that do that, but, um, but for me, it's 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 just becoming a better teacher. And I think you asked me a year ago to today, 
I think that would be um, the thing that stands out the most. I'm definitely a better teacher than what I was a year ago and a way better teacher than what I was 20 years ago. James, I always enjoy learning from you. And this is the, the final, it's not really a question, it's more of a story or a metaphor which you taught me on my podcast, which actually I'm applying with all the line of work I do, with all the interviews I do. Could you just share, especially for coaches, just listen to this metaphor, um, which James is going to share about, you know, creating your own path by being the car. And I'm going to leave the mic there for you to explain what I've just said. <laughs> That's funny because I, um, I used uh, that metaphor last night, actually, uh, on, on, on one of my students. Um, yeah, so, you know, one of the things that I learned about coaching is you got to give the power to, the, to your students and your players. At the end of the day, they've got to understand that, that they shouldn't be relying on anyone but themselves. And a lot of people come to me um, and they rely on me to, to take them to the, the top of the world. Um, it doesn't happen like that. It's, it's really you that takes yourself to the top of the world or wherever you want to go. So I tell my kids that, you know, this is your car. In fact, I don't even say your car anymore. I, I, I use the word bulldozer. <laughs> okay. I use the word bulldozer. This is, you're a little mini bulldozer and your hands are on the steering wheel of the bulldozer. Not mine. I just come around and I make sure that your tires are pumped and that your engine is in good order. That's it. But where the bulldozer goes is completely up to you. And and the reason why I use the word bulldozer is because I want the kids and, the, and my students to feel like they ain't following a track. They're making their own track. So if you've got a car, it's going down a road where others are going. But if you've got a bulldozer, you make your own tracks. And if you're going down a track and somebody's already been there, you're doing the right thing. You need to make your own journey. This is your journey. It belongs to you. And empowering your students to understand that that I can't rely on Coach James. I can't rely on my team. I can't rely on anyone but myself. And this is me. It's It belongs to me. This is my own journey. I feel that that empowers the kids and gives them full responsibility and enjoyment in knowing that this is mine. This is my journey. Not anyone else's. No one's pushing me. No one's telling me where to go. I can take this thing wherever I want to take it. Um, you know, and and I've I've actually had a few um, consultation sessions with siblings. Like a lot of times, you get a, an older sibling and a younger sibling, and you know the younger sibling doesn't feel right because the older sibling has kind of already started paving the road, and a lot of parents they say, you know. Look at your brother. Look at your brother's doing. Your brother's doing this and that. And, and, and the kid feels like they're going down the same road as the brother. And because the brother is two, three years older, can't really catch up because of the age difference. And the younger brother never feels good and, and feels like he's underachieving. But if you twist that and say, no, 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 no. Your brother's going down his road. And we don't want you to go down that road. We want you to go down your own road. And again, hands on the bulldozer and you go down your own road rather than following someone else's road. And it's so empowering. And I feel that you get so much more out of the kids, that so much more confidence. They feel so good. They have ownership. And and you'll find that that most likely um, they're going to have a lot more successful journey. James, I feel good. I really do. And again, you just keep laying the learning on me of where I need to <laughs> improve. And I hope the audience has really enjoyed this. I really do hope there's notes uh, that they're writing down. And as I said, put these into action and create your own blueprint. James, we've got to wrap up, my friend. 
thank you so much uh, for taking the time. It's always a pleasure chatting with you. And uh, yeah, thank you. That's all I'm going to say. Is that good? No, nah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks to uh, Athens Women's Football Summit. Um, I had the pleasure of, of being there last year. Fantastic um, event. Um, and I'm hoping next year we're, we're back to normal circumstances and we can get back on uh, to Athens and, and to the beautiful venue and we can all get in the same room and share ideas and help the women's game grow. And uh, thanks for having me. Always a pleasure and uh, I'll do anything for you guys. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Yep.